Hello everybody, my name is Jeremy Agnew. I am the host of the Grimdark History Podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. If this is your first time tuning in, what we do here is take a look at the fiction, whether it's a movie, book, video game, whatever it is that pulls into part of its lore, our own history. We explore the reality of the history, try to get as close as we can to a sense of the time, the place, the people there, in order to answer the question of, was it really like that? How much of what you saw or read or whatever that was in your piece of fiction, how much of that was the real truth versus whoever it was taking artistic license to tell you an entertaining story. Right now we're at episode five of a five-part series on Alexander the Great, who of course has been in a lot of popular fiction. We've been exploring uh, the entire history of Alexander the Great, and if this is your first time tuning in. You may want to go back to previous episodes, but if you don't, I'm going to give you a very quick recap right here. In episode one, we explored the background and history of Greece and Persia leading up to the assassination of Philip, that is the king of Macedon and Alexander the Great's father. We explored Philip's reforms, how Persian influenced his court was. We explored um, especially Alexander's mother, Olympias, her attachment and influence on Alexander's religious upbringing, the Orphic Mysteries religion, which of which Alexander's mother was a priestess of. She was indoctrinated into the Orphic Mysteries. We explored Philip's conquest of Greece. We explored the background leading up to that, the Peloponnesian Wars, the Greco-Persian Wars, and how all of these things kind of built up to allow Philip to conquer most of mainland and the Aegean Islands, Greece. And then in episode two, we took a tangential look at the religious experience that Alexander the Great and most other Greeks would have had throughout their lives when they took part in an actual traditional Greek sacrifice. We explored the emotions, the feelings, the sights, the sounds, the senses. What are you seeing? What are you smelling? What's the emotion feel like? That sort of thing to try and get a sense at what it would have felt like to be there because this is a very important experience to Alexander the Great. In episode three, took a look at the early phases of Alexander becoming king of Macedon. We explored what happened from the assassination of Philip, Alexander um, consolidating his control over the Macedonian throne, putting down the Thracian and the Theban revolts. We explored Alexander's conquest of Anatolia, and we explored the uh, surrender of the city of Jerusalem and the siege of Tyr. In episode four, we took a bit of a deeper dive look into how the Persians, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamian, pardon me, the Mesopotamians treated Alexander we took a look at his initial, uh, the initial effects of Alexander being worshipped and treated as a god. We took a look and compared and contrasted the accounts of Orion's Anabasis of Alexander and Plutarch's Life of Alexander the Great. Um, we explored and compared both of those to Alexander's time in Egypt, specifically around his visit to the Siwa Oasis, that would be the Oracle at Zeus Amon, one of the most popular and considered powerful oracles in the world at that time. We explored Alexander's time in Babylon and right up to the destruction of the city of Persepolis as well as Alexander's pursuit and uh, the death of Bessus. 
We explored slavery in Alexander's army and how that impacted what were his thoughts on that and how he treated uh, slaves and how the Greeks thought about uh, all the slaves that they were acquiring through the conquests and, and how that happened. In this episode, we're going to look at the last phases of Alexander's conquest of what, what's now modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan, that would be northern India. We'll look at wh- how and whether or not Alexander wept when there were no more worlds left to conquer. We're going to have a lot of fun digging into the history of that quote. That will be at the end of the episode. And we're also going to explore how religion impacted Alexander. We're going to tie the little tidbits of religion that I've been talking about all into this episode. Episode 2 is going to come back uh, pretty strong uh, in terms of having a reference point to talk about. And then this will be the end and wrap up of our epic series on Alexander the Great. And next month we're going to start a brand new series. So continue listening. Thank you very much. I hope you've been enjoying the history of Alexander the Great. My father, as I was saying, this was a very long time ago. It said he was known then as Alessander or Sikander the Third Omacadon, I believe. He told me that, so it must be true. Anyway, he came to the river Hyphasis and crossed it and wept. For, as he put it, there were no new worlds to conquer. Beside the Hyphasis, my father wept because, at that time, he felt he had accomplished all he could. His ambitions were achieved, and the revelation shook him. He was not proud or satisfied. He was bereft. This was a quote from the novel End and the Death, Volume 1, by author Dan Abnett from the Black Library. This is, of course, for fans who have been following the show, part of the theme of our Season 1 of the Grim Dark History podcast, exploring the intersection between history and popular fiction. The popular fiction we've been following in Season 1 has been all the characters that the uh, or pardon me, all the historical characters that the Warhammer 40,000 character, the Emperor of Mankind, has been throughout our own history. And we've been exploring the history of Alexander the Great for several episodes now, and we we'll probably may even have been forgotten that our focus here is to talk about how popular fiction and history interact. Well, Here's the reason why we have been discussing Alexander the Great for the last several episodes. In the novel, The End of the Death, Volume 1, the character known as the Primarch and War Master Horus has an interview with someone by the, another character by the name of Mercedes Oliton. And what I just read to you was an interview or an excerpt from an interview that uh, Horace had with Mercedes. And in it, he discussed a t- story the emperor told Horace of many long t- thousands of years ago when he was Alexander the Great, that he crossed the river Hyphasis and wept because there were no new worlds left to conquer. And we're going to get into today the meat of that quote, what it means from our own popular culture, what it means from the historical documents that we have. Did this quote happen? Did Alexander the Great actually weep when he crossed the Hyphasis River? And were there no new worlds left to conquer? Was this a revelation that came to him? We're going to find out all of this today as we explore Alexander's conquest of Afghanistan and Pakistan and into northern India. And then we're going to find out how Alexander died and what his last days were like. And then we're going to dig into this, this quote here to find out exactly the roots of 
why Alexander wept when there were no new worlds left to conquer. So join us today as we explore probably one of the most insidious quotes in popular history, and that is that Alexander wept when there were no new worlds left to conquer. Now, as we left Alexander the Great in our last episode, he had just finished off Bessus, and he was left king over the majority of the former Persian Empire. There is still significant chunks of the Persian Empire that existed under Darius III that are not under Alexander's control. And even further than that, there are still significant chunks of the what would be called the former parts of Persian Empire uh, that weren't even under Darius's control, but were under the control of the Persian Empire uh, previous, um, under previous rulers. Now, Alexander is at the height of his glory him and his army have more wealth than uh, anybody in the Greek world has ever seen. They have access to vast resources of slaves, vast food stores, vast wealth from trade, both local and international. They have access to the tithes of population that would have normally been integrated into the army of the Persian Empire, which is now available for Alexander to integrate into his army. And this integration becomes a significant bone of contention between Alexander and several of his very popular generals and his what we would call his companions. There are other bones of contention going on, and I mentioned those um, earlier as well. Alexander's willingness to adopt the Persian form of governance, which is to effectively leave who was ever in charge of a governor of a province or a region still in charge, so long as they pay homage to and provide taxes and tithes and whatever it is Alexander wants or needs. The Greeks would prefer that Greek people be the ones in charge, and in a lot of cases, Alexander does put these people in charge. But in other cases, he leaves the existing people that are already there in charge. This would include um, Persians, Mesopotamians, uh, Punjab people from the, uh, the Indian campaigns. These are bones of contention because the Greek people believe very much in Greek first, Greek always. And Alexander is Greek first when it works, but uh, you know if we need to keep moving and we do, let's stick with whatever works right now. Don't rock the boat. Let's keep the uh, current governor in charge. He has all the political contacts. He knows how to collect the taxes properly. All that sort of thing. This is a problem. And this alone would be uh, a not insurmountable problem. But there are other problems that come with being the Persian king. The Persians have a form of... Uh, paying respect and homage to their kings that the Greeks do not. This is called proskinesis by the Greeks, and it is a term which basically means you prostrate yourself before the king. So you'd get on the ground, you know, the hands and knees bowing before the king. You've probably seen that in a lot of movies where you'll, you know, you get on your knees and lay out on the ground, your hands are out in front of you. And then you might king, kiss the foot or the hand of the king to show your respect. 
this this form of paying respect to the king in the Greek world these things are done too but these are only done to the gods these are only done as forms of worship to the gods and the fact that the Persians are doing this to Alexander freaks out the Greeks and irritates them they don't like people um, acknowledging Alexander as a god that's how they would see this particular act and Alexander uh, not only allows this to continue the custom of the Persians to do this but he also begins to insist that his uh, Greek forces and his fellow Macedonians do the same this becomes a real significant problem so much so that there are arguments and hearings formal proceedings and stuff like that that the Greeks put forward their argument in Alexander's formal court that this should not be the case the main proponent of this or the main proponent I guess who we would say is who is opposed to this proskinesis is a uh, fellow in Alexander's court called Callisthenes. Callisthenes is a philosopher. He's also what you would uh, basically call Alexander's personal court um, historian. He's employed by Alexander to specifically write the history and biography of Alexander as he performs his invasion of the Persian Empire. Callisthenes is a well-respected and acknowledged um, leader of thought in Greece. He was also part of being uh, raised, or pardon me, educated by Aristotle along with Alexander. It's how Alexander came to know uh, Callisthenes. Callisthenes puts forward the argument that this uh, proskinesis is just not right, not for the Greeks, not for anybody. And Alexander uh, agrees that the Greeks won't have to do this, but the Persians and his other subjects in the former Achaemenid Empire, they're the ones that still must do this. And in addition to this, Alexander has begun to adopt the Persian form of royal dress that's appropriate for a Persian king. Now, he's not wearing trousers, which is actually a very popular form of Persian dress. This has been uh, invented by the Persians because Persians were uh, primarily a... Uh, uh, mounted horse riding cavalry civilization they invented trousers because well it made riding less painful you could ride for longer you know if you're a man you didn't have to uh, worry about crushing bits of yourself and whatnot alexander's not wearing trousers that would just be too insane but he is wearing the Persian dress. He's adopting other manners of uh, dress that's appropriate for a Persian king. And this ticks off the Greeks even more. They see him as abandoning what makes Alexander a superior person in their eyes. So there's this problem that has been brewing for months of Alexander allowing uh, former Persian governors and uh, local uh, dignitaries and, and administrators to remain in positions of power. That's a problem that's been brewing um, not just for months, but for years, effectively since the beginning of this whole campaign. Alexander was doing this um, from day one when he was in Anatolia. So there's this problem, there's this um, rejection of Alexander's um, Greek attributes, rejecting Greek dress codes, rejecting Greek, 
pardon me, rejecting Greek manners, rejecting Greek courtly um, attitudes and rules and kind of codes of conduct, and in favor embracing Persian codes of conduct, Persian dress, Persian mannerisms. This is a significant um, rejection of what made Alexander king to his Greek companions. So Callisthenes um, is the leader of his, this um, kind of pro-Greek attitude, puts him on the outs with Alexander. But before we get to what happened to Callisthenes, we're going to talk about Philotus and Parmenion. I mentioned Parmenion several times. He's cropped up in the background as I've been dropping uh, quotes from uh, my uh, um, work, or pardon me, from my readings of Orion and Plutarch. I mentioned in episode three how important Parmenion was to Alexander. He was the first general to support Alexander's claim to the throne. He proactively took it upon himself to, um, I guess you would say, uh, proactively murder any rival generals to Alexander's claim. So he helped solidify Alexander's claim to the Macedonian throne. He was considered by Alexander to be an extremely trusted advisor. He was a very close friend and confidant to his father, Philip of Macedon. And Parmenion has been a general that was given commands of his own armies in support of Alexander during the conquest of Anatolia. Parmenion was instrumental in helping to, uh, re pardon me, lead critical parts of Alexander's army in several major battles. Parmenion is Alexander's literal right-hand man. He is next to Alexander, the most popular person, an influential person within Alexander's army, and he is so trusted by Alexander that while Alexander has been pursuing Bessus and moving towards uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan and northern India, he's left Parmenian in charge of the Persian treasury and supporting Alexander's supply lines as they get longer and longer. This is an extremely trusted person. He's in charge of dozens of thousands of men to help defend Alexander. And Parmenion has a son by the name of Philotus, who himself is an important and critical person within Alexander's army. He's given a preeminent role as the leader of the Companion Cavalry, which is the cavalry component that um, supports Alexander and has performed critical actions in several major battles. Philotus is exposed in a plot to assassinate Alexander, presumably because of these tensions that I mentioned earlier. Now, it's not necessarily Philotus that was um, the one who was going to wield the knife, so to speak. There's about a dozen people involved in this plot. And one of those people has a lover who himself has a brother. And uh, the assassin told his lover about the presumably Im imminent plot to kill Alexander. That lover told his brother, and it got back to Alexander, that there was a plot to kill him and assassinate him from his own Greek generals and several lieutenants. They're all captured. They're tortured. The name of Philotus is dropped. Philotus is not one of the, not named as a conspirator initially, but it is revealed that Philotus knew the plot was happening 
but he chose not to notify anyone or do anything to try and stop it. This was enough to have him charged as a co-conspirator and a traitor to Alexander. Philotus was tortured, questioned, and then murdered. Now, of course, don't forget here, Philotus is the son of the second most powerful man in the entire world at this time. So Alexander is probably sweating some buckets here, wondering what the heck is he going to do with Parmenion. Parmenion is days away, may or may not have been aware of the plot. All sources point to probably no, and that this was an independent act by Philotus and the conspirators local to the army. Parmenion would not be privy to the struggles um, and everything that was exactly happening in what would be modern-day Uzbekistan. Instead, Alexander has a choice. He can do nothing to Parmenion and trust that Parmenion's loyalty to him is stronger than his familial love for his son. Or Alexander could believe or choose to believe that it is likely that Parmenion in control of the treasury, in control of cutting off Alexander's supply lines, and in control of an army in his own right, might choose this opportunity to rise up against Alexander. And Alexander sends his own assassins to go and kill Parmenion proactively. He can't take the risk that Parmenion might choose to go against him, that Parmenion might take the treasury away, prevent Alexander from paying his forces, might cut off his supply lines and starve him out in a arid area of the world at this moment. So he makes this decision. And there's also another decision, which is that as part of Greek culture, much like Roman culture, the father is responsible for the actions of the son and the family, and that even though Philotus was a grown man, an adult, Parmenion would still be responsible for his actions if they were dishonorable. So an action that was worthy of the death of Philotus a betrayal by Philotus would be effectively a betrayal by Parmenion, whether he knew it or not. In the worlds of the, or pardon me, in the eyes of the Greeks, Parmenion was just as guilty of the betrayal as Philotus was. And so Alexander has his most trusted advisor, the man who supported him in his claim to the throne, the man who loved his father and was a loyal servant, he has him assassinated to protect his own kingship. This is what happened to one of the most powerful men in the world, like I said, the second most powerful man in Alexander's army. Next up on our list of uh, betrayals of Alexander the Great, we have the story of Cletus the Black, yet another important general within Alexander's army. After the death of Philotus, Cletus is put in charge of Alexander's companion cavalry. He was a brave warrior and respected general. He'd been with Alexander from the start, was also, like Parmenian, part of Philip's armies and generals and confidants. Cletus actually saves Alexander's life in one of the first major engagements. He uh, defends Alexander and prevents the rival Persian prince 
from uh, killing Alexander basically at the very start of the um, invasion. While they're in modern-day Uzbekistan, Alexander, as he's getting ready to move his army uh, through Afghanistan and proceed into Pakistan, crossing the Himalayan mountains, he marks Cletus the Black as governor of Bactria, So that's modern-day Uzbekistan. This takes place in what's modern-day Samarkand today. This is a city that existed even back then. This is how ancient a place Samarkand is. It's a very wealthy land. There's lots of wealth, land, and trade um, going through this particular city. Cletus takes this as a problem. He sees this as a demotion. He views Bactria as an uncivilized place filled with horse nomads. And in part, or pardon me, and the northern parts of it are. This is where uh, the Scythian people live. Now, I say Scythian or Scythian. This is a very broad and generic term that encompasses a lot of very different social groups. It would be the equivalent of me saying, um, if we're talking about people, uh, the Native Americans that live here in uh, Canada, if I was to call them First Nations people, that would be a term we could use to group together and define, broadly speaking, of an extremely varied and uh, different uh, groups of people that had dozens of different languages, different cultures, different social practices, and in many times were not even uh, at all related to each other in any way or shape or form. Not for thousands of years had they been that way. That would be like Scythians. Broadly speaking, these are nomadic horse archers, that broadly inhabit a large plains area roughly spanning from modern-day Ukraine all the way over to the outer reaches of Mongolia. There would be dozens, probably hundreds of different civilizations and nomadic groups that live in this area. Bactria is the borderlands of this between these people and the Persian Empire. Northern Bactria has minor settlements, the Scythian population that lives there. These are kind of minor trading settlements. You know, they stop at here. There's a few traders that live there to do business with the Persian Empire, and then they go on their way. It's not a place you can really conquer. There's not a lot of glory to be had here. And so Cletus sees this as kind of effectively banishment from Alexander's court. And while they're spending their time in Samarkand, Cletus and Alexander and the rest of Alexander's generals, they're partying and they get drunk. And Cletus and Alexander get into an argument over Cletus's banishment. It's a bone of contention. This was the right-hand man of Alexander, you know, one of his closest companions, generals, a confidant of his father, and now he's, from his perspective, being banished to the middle of nowhere. No more glory to be had and being taken away from the rest of his Greek companions. He vents his frustrations on Alexander, and it boils over. It gets violent. Alexander demands him, uh, pardon me, his being held as a prisoner, demands he be arrested. The Greek soldiers and other companion generals are loath to do that. This is a drunk argument. Cletus hasn't really committed any sort of betrayal. And instead they try to pull the two apart, let, a, let them sleep it off. And maybe in the morning people will uh, talk with more sober thoughts. But instead, Cletus and Alexander get into it again that same night, round two. 
and Cletus calls Alexander an illegitimate king who leached off his father. Alexander, well, you can imagine he's not very happy with that. He's so unhappy with that. He's so displeased that Alexander grabs a spear, either from a guard that was standing there or from a one that was just near the wall, and he impales Cletus on the spear, killing him. Later, as Alexander sobers up, he realizes the magnitude of what this means. The rest of Alexander's companions and generals uh, don't really look at Alexander the same after this. He's lost something in their eyes. This is on top of Alexander's adopting the Persian dress. On top of Alexander making non-Greeks governors and putting them in positions of power over, over and above other Greeks. On top of this whole proskinesis bowing and worshipping Alexander like he were a Greek god. This is just another thing adding to the pile of grievances against Alexander. Now back to our friend Callisthenes. Within a year of Cletus's death, Alexander was out boar hunting with a party. One of his royal pages broke protocol and assisted Alexander in killing a boar without being asked. This would have been extremely demeaning to Alexander. It was tantamount to basically calling Alexander a woman who couldn't defend himself. Someone who couldn't properly hunt an animal. In response to this um, outrage, Alexander has the page, a boy by the name of Hermelaus, publicly humiliated and flogged in front of the Greeks. Hermelaus is a student of Callisthenes. And again, Callisthenes was strongly opposed to Alexander's Persian attitudes. He argued publicly against the proskinesis. He was extremely outspoken about Alexander's treatment of other Greeks, about his Persianization. He was not happy with the, what happened to Cletus the Black. This is just all one thing leading to the another in Callisthenes' book. Well, Hermelaus didn't want to take this humiliation laying down, and he plots with some of the other royal pages to assassinate Alexander while he sleeps. It was part of the duties of the pages was to basically stand guard over Alexander at night while he slept. Hermelaus is exposed in the plot to assassinate Alexander and under questioning, and when I say questioning, I mean under torture, Callisthenes is fingered as being a co-conspirator in this plot. And Callisthenes is, depending on which account you're reading, he's either imprisoned until he dies in prison, or he's crucified right then and there and dies. These are some of the uh, results of the culture clash that is erupting in Alexander's army as he moves into India, what would be modern-day uh, Pakistan, as Alexander moves into what will become modern-day Pakistan, the tensions that have been boiling over for the last two years of his uh, campaign really come to the forefront. We had the deaths of several major important people within Alexander's court the previous year before Alexander 
uh, crosses the mountains into Pakistan. And while he is in Pakistan, Alexander has his first major battles that are struggles. You could say his army, so used to rolling over the Persian um, Empire armies, they get their noses bloodied several times in his Indian campaigns. And even though Alexander successfully conquers several minor kingdoms and several independent city-states and huge chunks of Pakistan, he is struggling because his supply lines have effectively been cut off. There's a giant Himalayan mountain range between him and his Persian supply lines. So Alexander is forced to feed his army on what he can uh, take from his Indian conquests. It'll be a combination of sacking of cities and villages, as well as the ones that uh, uh, bend the will, bend the knee to him, providing tribute to him in the form of food, wealth, slaves, etc. But as Alexander moves deeper into Pakistan, his supply lines get cut off even inside India. The countryside is rife with rebellion from the locals. They seem to be um, egged on by the Hindu Brahmin priests that live in the region. It's such a struggle that Alexander is forced to send chunks of his army backwards to put these revolts down even as he's trying to move his army forwards. They're caught up in dealing with dozens of these little rebellions from the Hindu priests that are stirring up um, local popular revolt. To deal with us, Alexander takes a local king. He takes off, uh, pardon me, follows his process that has worked so well for the Persian Empire and has been working so well for him so far. And he puts a local king in charge of all these areas that he's conquered. This is a king known as Porus. He's a local Indian king. Alexander effectively doubles and maybe even triples the size of Porus's kingdom after Alexander defeats Porus in battle. That puts a local ruler who follows the Hindu religion in charge. And Porus's job is just to collect tribute and help feed Alexander's army. And that helps quell some of the popular revolt that was happening. Alexander still has to deal with these uh, Brahmin priests in the countryside, oftentimes just sending people into the area, and uh, you would look at it as a religious persecution nowadays, just killing any Brahmin priests in order to put them down and stop the people that are stirring up the rebellions. On top of this, we, of course, had all the struggles that led up to it previously with the deaths of the major people in his army. But Alexander, of course, not knowing the weather patterns that impact the Indian continent, happens to have chosen his time of uh, invasion to coincide with the monsoon season. And Alexander finds his armies in the middle of the monsoon season with several major rivers, of course, flooding from the torrential downpours. His army itself experiencing rain unlike they had ever seen. And of course, the uh, massive winds that come with this. There are lightning strikes that actually kill parts of his army. From the Greeks' perspective, they must be feeling that this is the very gods themselves sending bolts of lightning down from heaven. 
flooding the rivers, taking away his army, preventing crossings, slowing crossings, and in times just sweeping away hundreds of his soldiers. People are getting sick with diseases they've never seen before. They're encountering strange animals that they've never seen before. Poisonous snakes, monkeys. This is a world that's completely alien to them. But Alexander tries to press on, conquer more land, and still his Greek forces get their noses bloodied more at every battle. It never gets easier. Morale gets lower. There are more and more wounded. And as Alexander gets to the Hyphasis River, which is a tributary of the Indus, it's one of the largest rivers in the world to Alexander. As they get to this river and they, they're at the height of the monsoon season, Rains have been pouring down on them. His army has finally had enough. They've seen Alexander's fall from his height of Greekness. He is no more a Helen, a Helene, I guess you'd call it. He's abandoned what it means to be Greek. He's adopted Persian dress, Persian customs, Persian attitudes. Several of the most powerful and influential um, generals within Alexander's court have been murdered. Parmenion, Cletus the Black, Philotus. Callisthenes wasn't a general, but no less an influential person in Alexander's court. All of these people have been dead. There's been multiple assassination plots. And the very gods themselves, Zeus, is sending lightning bolts down from Olympus to warn his army that they are going too far. And now they've had enough. They won't go another, any further. And they threaten Alexander unless he turns around. They will abandon Alexander right there in India unless he turns around. So Alexander, without any choice seeing his only thing that keeps him in power, his army, willing to abandon him in this strange land. He has no choice. He submits to their demand. It would have been probably the most crippling defeat that Alexander could ever have. He didn't fall in battle. He wasn't defeated in personal combat. It wasn't even an arrow from some distant archer that brought him down. He was abandoned by his own generals and army right there at the banks of the Hyphasis River. And so Alexander agrees and they turn the army around to march back to Babylon. And on his way back to Babylon, Alexander is already beginning planning for his new conquest. Even as the long march down the banks of the Indus River to the Persian Gulf and back up through southern Iran into Babylon, Alexander is already planning a future invasion of what will be Saudi Arabia. He is planning to have his Greek generals training the Persian Empire population in Macedonian army tactics. He's sending his Greek forces back home with all the wealth that they've collected, with the slaves, with the booty, whatever it is they've earned. Many of them are being sent back home in honors and glory. 
Several of them are choosing to stay with Alexander because they're loyal to his court. Several of them are governors. There's lots more wealth to be had. But Alexander, as I said, is planning a second invasion of Arabia as he comes to his own end and dies. Alexander's death itself is a mystery. It's rumored, or at least the Greeks, rumored that he might have been poisoned. Over several days, he has a fever, unending thirst. He's slowly becoming paralyzed, finding it difficult to move or breathe before finally he dies. But even though he dies for several days after, his body does not begin to decompose. This leads more to the myth of Alexander the Great becoming a god. The, the Greeks see this as a sign of Alexander's apotheosis to godhood. Alexander, even as they... Um, rejected Alexander's godhood and divinity as much as the Persians embraced it. They backtrack now. There's physical evidence of Alexander's divinity right in front of them. What modern people think is difficult to tell. Of course, we're only... Uh, being armchair physicians. One theory is malaria killed him. It was running rampant in Mesopotamia, especially in Babylon. Another interesting theory is Guillain-Barre syndrome, which has symptoms of numbling, pain, particularly in the legs and back, which is where Alexander um, physicians noted he had pain, eventually leading to paralysis and then eventually death. So he might have looked to be dead, barely able to draw breath. And over a few days, even though he wasn't technically dead yet, he would appear visibly dead. He'd have practically no pulse, almost no breath. His eyes wouldn't be able to move. He'd be locked in, but conscious and aware, but just barely able to breathe. And over a few days, he might eventually just stop breathing that or die from dehydration. A nightmarish thought to have anybody go that way. But you can imagine that appearing to the Greeks and the citizens of proof of someone's apotheosis into godhood. One of the questions that I asked myself as I was preparing for the series and doing the research and putting my thoughts down about what I was even going to talk about and how I was going to structure this was religion and its importance to Alexander. Of course, I've just told you about how, at the moment of Alexander's death, everybody felt Alexander had achieved godhood because his body failed to decompose. There's another reason I wanted to talk about religion and its themes as through this. Because... There are over 100 instances of Alexander either performing a sacrifice or worshipping a god in the books that I've read. In Plutarch's Life of Alexander the Great, there's 21 instances of Alexander worshipping or performing a sacrifice to the gods. In Orion's Anabasis of Alexander, there are 92 separate instances where it's documented that Alexander worshipped the gods or performed a sacrifice. 
And we know from both Plutarch, Orion, and several other sources that Alexander daily performed sacrifices and worship to the gods. It's very clear from my reading how important Alexander's relationship to the gods was to him. And one of the questions I asked myself was, is there any relationship between this and the supposed connection to being the son of Zeus and India and the belief in Alexander's godhood? And it turns out that there definitely is a link. The modern scholarship seemed to feel Alexander's campaign in India was about achieving all the wealth Persian Empire had in India. It was an extremely wealthy land that had been a former province of the Persian Empire, and of course it would be not out of the realm of possibility that Alexander wanted for himself to be able to say he had the largest land ever, wanting to conquer as much as possible to get the wealth of Persia to get the wealth of Egypt, to get the wealth of Pakistan. So that is definitely a motivation for Alexander to invade India, the Indian continent. Another motivation to achieve, um, pardon me, another motivation to invade the Indian continent would be Alexander's religion. I mentioned in our very first episode, Alexander's mother was a priest of the Orphic Mysteries cult. She was indoctrinated into this. She would have been seen as having secret knowledge, access to perhaps powerful magic and spells, the ability to communicate more closely with divine forces, specifically Dionysus, that god. And Dionysus is the son of Zeus. And of course, Olympias, Alexander's mother, has a dream that Zeus impregnates her with Alexander prior to her consummating her marriage with Philip. And this, of course, leads to the myths and legends and tales that would follow Alexander of him being the son of Zeus all through his life. Now we know, of course, Dionysus as the god of wine. We know, if you were listening to me in episode one, Dionysus is also the god of suffering and rebirth. That was part of the religion and beliefs of the Orphic Mysteries cult. But what you don't know, what you probably do not know, and what will be news to you, and I found fascinating as I was researching Dionysus the God in the Orphic Mysteries cult, was that Dionysus was a demigod. He was a human. He was born from Zeus impregnating a human woman. Dionysus is born and killed several times. He's reborn multiple times. But each time as he's reborn, before he achieves godhood, Zeus ordered Dionysus to prepare a war and raise an army and invade India, the continent. And as Dionysus goes through Anatolia, as he goes through Mesopotamia, as he goes through the lands of Persia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, into northern India and into the Indian continent, Dionysus is facing all the armies of the people who lived in these lands, and at times um, being opposed by other gods who are trying to prevent his apotheosis into godhood and while allow the story goes while Dionysus is in India he founds a city there which Alexander claims to have found again as his army is moving through India this was the goal Zeus gave to Dionysus 
as what was required of him in order to achieve godhood. And after Dionysus successfully invades and conquers India, that is exactly what happens. Dionysus is raised to godhood. Hercules himself is another person who invaded and conquered a lot of lands and fought a lot of battles. And this was also required of him before Zeus would raise him to godhood as well. And I asked myself, was Alexander, who maybe was seeing himself as the son of Zeus, was he maybe in his heart of hearts, in his deep thoughts that he wouldn't voice maybe to anybody except his mother, was he trying to achieve godhood himself the only way he knew how, by following the example of his distant half-brother Dionysus, and getting an opportunity that never would have existed had not Philip done the hard work for him, but which Alexander was able to reap the rewards of having an army, invading Anatolia, invading Mesopotamia, invading Persia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and into India, and successfully conquering lands that had not been done for thousands of years according to Greek history and religion. This was what was required of Dionysus to achieve godhood. And I wonder if Alexander's extreme piety was not Alexander's attempts to prove his worthiness to the gods, and that his invasion into the Indian continent maybe had a secondary goal that would cause him to push his army to the point of breaking, to the point of betrayal, in order to achieve what Dionysus was required to achieve in order to, pardon me, in order to become a god. And when his army threatened to mutiny, threatened to abandon him in India, Alexander reluctantly agrees and turns around. And as he's in Babylon, not knowing that his death is only weeks away, he's already planning the invasion of Arabia. He's already raising a new army. He's sending away those that want to retire. He's bringing up new forces, training new people, integrating even greater his Persian kingdom into a brand new multinational, multi-ethnic force. Also headed jointly by Greeks and Persians. This is Alexander attempting, at least in my mind, attempting to still strive for godhood. And I ask myself also, what would somebody who believed they could become a god do? What would they value that somebody who believed they were mortal would not? And it's strewn all throughout the documentations of the various accounts of Alexander, his extraordinary, what they call, generosity. In order to invade Anatolia and even give the invasion army a kickoff, he'd leverage the majority of his kingdom. He was deeply in debt. He had barely enough money and food and supplies to keep his army in the field for a month. And while he's in Babylon, he pays off the entire debts of all his army yet again. He's extraordinarily generous with giving away lands, titles, money. The physical property of the world doesn't really seem to interest Alexander, except that it can be used to create loyalty in military forces 
and the supporting government structure required to enable the militaries to grow and continue to conquer. Alexander makes no allowances for the continuation of his empire. He doesn't really seem to care about his heirs. It's told that he would like to have an heir, but there doesn't seem to be really any attempts to govern the kingdom. It's not his primary focus. Conquering new lands is his primary focus. And acquiring the wealth doesn't seem to be a focus, except that that wealth can be given away generously to purchase the services of an even greater military force to continue conquering. And so I asked myself, as I was reading through all this and these thoughts were popping in my head, what would somebody who believed they could become a god value when your only measure for what it takes to become a god is to conquer far away in strange lands? Would you value wealth? No. Except that it could service conquering. Would you value loyalty? Yes. Would you value military conquests? Yes. It's the only measure by which the gods seem to value you. And the only other measure for how the gods judge a person is their complete and to total obedience to the gods. And Alexander daily worshipped. And there's lots of accounts um, written down where Alexander would even concern himself with the piety of his fellow soldiers and generals. If somebody missed a sacrifice or some offering to the gods, he would make sure that person had extra in order to be generous and beg the forgiveness of the gods. Alexander was clearly very emotionally and personally involved with divine forces. And I like to think that even though Alexander didn't necessarily believe he was a god, he certainly enjoyed the trappings of being worshipped as one. And I like to think him going into India and attempting to conquer the continent was an attempt to mirror the achievements of his distant half-brother, Dionysus, in order to become a god. And when that failed him, he began plans immediately for a brand new invasion for another new mysterious foreign continent, that being Arabia. This is Alexander not believing he was a god, but Alexander believing he could become one. As we wind down our five-part epic on Alexander the Great, I think we should go back to the quote I read to you at the start. I promised you to talk about whether or not Alexander wept because there were no more worlds left to conquer. Now, as you can tell from my opening quote, that there's probably no real example of Alexander weeping because there were no more worlds left to conquer in the historical record. But it does come from somewhere. So I thought it would be fun to spend these last few minutes just talking about this quote because it has a fascinating history of it of its own and it ties directly into popular fiction and of course the intersection with history which is the theme of our podcast so let's dig into Alexander and whether or not he ever wept when there were no more worlds left to conquer I'm going to start by telling or reading to you a quote from Plutarch now, aside from the life of Alexander the Great, Plutarch wrote a kind of secondary history to this called Moralia, 
Moralia is not really a history in the same way that Plutarch's The Life of Alexander the Great isn't a history. Moralia is written as a dialogue, and to familiarize the audience with what a dialogue means to Plutarch versus what it means to us, to us, a dialogue is exactly that. It's two people talking back and forth. But to Plutarch's time and to other Greeks and Romans for hundreds of years, starting at approximately 400 before Common Era, this dialogue literary format developed and became quite popular. A dialogue in Plutarch's time represents a philosophical discussion between two or more imaginary characters trying to prove a point through what's known as the Socratic method. This is a form of people asking logical questions and responding to those questions with answers which generate further questions as these two people in their logical dialogue navigate the logic and reason of one person's position in this argument over another, and they eventually come to some agreement over what the correct form is. And in Plutarch's Moralia, he wrote a dialogue between Alexander the Great and some other people, and in that, the quote that I'm going to read to you is as follows. Quoting Plutarch now. Have I not, quoth he, good cause to weep, that being as there are an infinite number of worlds, I am not yet the lord of one. This was uh, the dialogue character of Alexander the Great having a Socratic method argument with another character. This is not Alexander the Great in any historical format saying that he has a cause to weep because he isn't the lord of any single world. Also uh, by Plutarch, written as a uh, companion to the history of Alexander the Great, Plutarch wrote another history called The Life of Caesar. And in that, Caesar is weeping as he's looking at the corpse of Alexander the Great on display in the, his tomb in Alexandria. And quoting Plutarch here, Caesar says, Do you think, said he, I have not just cause to weep, when I consider that Alexander at my age had conquered so many nations, and I have all this done, nothing that is memorable. Here is two quotes that are kind of about Alexander weeping, but not. In Moralia, it's a dialogue, it's not history. Plutarch, Life of Caesar, it is another imagined discussion, but it's not Alexander, it's Caesar talking about Alexander, and Caesar weeping, realizing that Alexander, uh, by his age, had already basically conquered all the Persian Empire. Later on, as we fast forward into the 1700s, an English playwright by the name of William Congreve uh, wrote a play called The Way of the World. And in that, one of the characters in the play says the following, quoting William Congreve, What a wretch is he who must survive his hope. Nothing remains when that day comes but to sit down and weep like Alexander when he wanted other worlds to conquer. This is from 1700s, and there is a definite hint of Alexander weeping because there were no more worlds left to conquer. In 18, uh, in the mid 18, pardon me, in the late 1800s, 
American author James Baldwin in a uh, short story from uh, the novel 30 More Famous Stories Retold. James Baldwin retells a part of the story of Alexander the Great. And James Baldwin says the following, quoting James Baldwin now, Then he sat down and wept because there were not other worlds for him to conquer. Here's a lot of interesting quotes showing a, a definite evolution that uh, didn't exist you know, at the time of Plutarch, when people were writing the histories of Alexander, it's not in any other source from the uh, most closest contemporary histories of Alexander. William Congreve, in his play, The Way of the World, definitely writes about Alexander weeping because he wanted more worlds to conquer. And James Baldwin, in his short story of Alexander the Great, definitely says Alexander sat down and wept because there were not other worlds for him to conquer. This is not the end of Alexander weeping and having no more worlds left to conquer, though. Getting into the modern age of movies, we have uh, the movie of late, I think, of Cliffordsford. And now that we have a movie, I've got an actual quote from the movie I'm going to drop in here. So let's just listen to the brief clip from of late, I think, of Cliffordsford. He cried because he had no more worlds to conquer. What? That was Alexander the Great. He cried because he had no more worlds to conquer. And what I think is great here is um, definitely in no uncertain terms do we have Alexander weeping because there were no more worlds left to conquer. But I'm willing to bet 100% of my audience has never heard of the movie of late, I think, of Cliffordsford, let alone seen it enough to recognize that quote but there is probably an excellent chunk of my audience that knows this quote and I'm going to play this for you now and you tell me if you can recognize the movie it's from and when Alexander saw the breadth of his domain he wept for there were no more worlds to conquer did you recognize the movie? I'm willing to bet if you didn't, you at the very least recognized late great actor Alan Rickman. That is Alan Rickman as notorious and uh, famous villain from the 1988 uh, cult action movie Die Hard. In that scene, Alan Rickman actually ad-libs that line and it made it into the final cut but from that point on Alexander weeping for there were no more worlds left to conquer had itself solidly embedded into the pop culture hearts and minds of everybody who grew up in the 80s and 90s and if you are Telling yourself today that Alexander wept because there were no more worlds left to conquer. You have the great actor Alan Rickman to thank for that. Now I was aware going into this for my research that Plutarch was the ultimate root of Alexander weeping. And I was aware that Alan Rickman's 1988... Uh, Hans Gruber quote was the thing that most people in pop culture today um, what that what they're drawing from when they think of Alexander weeping because there were no more worlds left to conquer but I wasn't aware of some of these other things and as I was doing my research into the history of Alexander weeping because there were no more worlds left to conquer I found uh, excellent YouTube video documenting all of these things and I'm going to 
point them to you, point that point you to that YouTube video and channel right now. YouTuber at William Elder six seven eight eight has a, a YouTube video, and uh, I will link to that in the article that goes through this and very other various other common misquotes in history and pop culture. I encourage you to click on the link. And uh, even though it's a very old video and William Elder isn't active anymore, pop onto the channel, watch the video, give it a like, give him a subscribe, and uh, drop a comment in there just to say, hey, we heard about this from the Grimdark History and just wanted to say thank you because Jeremy thanks you for his hard work. Because William Elder did the hard work, I was able to add this fun bit to the end of this episode and series. And he made this last few minutes here a lot easier researched for me. And I want to give William Elder the props he was due. Thank you very much. To quote fellow Canadian podcaster Sebastian Major, Okay, we are done. We have wrapped up. What I never thought I would say is a five-part series on any one specific topic. But here we are. Come heck or high water, I was determined we were going to wrap up Alexander the Great this episode. There is so much more I could have talked about and wanted to talk about. We didn't really get to dig in too deeply into Alexander's Indian campaign, his return from India into Babylon and his time there. There's a lot of very interesting history that happened in that period. But I had to cut off somewhere. We could have gone for probably another two or three episodes and then I'd still feel like we we're probably missing some stuff. But at the same time, there's a lot of exciting history coming up on brand new topics, and I'm excited to get to those too. Alexander the Great's been in a lot of popular fiction, and if the podcast keeps going, if everybody's happy with it and the fans demand it, I will certainly happily go back and revisit Alexander, and we can talk a lot more about the things left unsaid in this series. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. There's going to be a teaser coming up where we talk about our brand new series in a few weeks. So stay tuned to listen for that. I'm very excited. I have a special guest that's come to give a talk. And we're going to have a nice discussion and interview about our brand new topic. So stay tuned. It's going to be fun. going to be fascinating. And it's been in a lot of popular fiction as well. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. This has been an episode of the Grimdark History Podcast.